and our future vision. So that's why I'm working with the team currently at the moment. Also, I'll do a call out for the user survey as well. That's important for us to get feedback through that as well. So that's um, still going at the moment. And um, Joe, when does it finish? Is it the end of next week? Uh, the 4th of December. So everyone should have got an email asking them to complete it. And there are reminders going out every week if you haven't completed it yet. So your, um, if you could, your feedback is really important and valuable so we can shape um, the Nectar Cloud services in the future to better meet your needs. Excellent, thank you. So um, I won't speak for too long, but yes, very excited to have joined ARDC to be working with the um, Nectar Core Services team and the um, Cloud um, Program team and I'm very keen for your feedback. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Carmel. Uh, I'll get started. See. Um, all right, so just a very brief background. So as you hopefully, and, and apologies in advance if you saw my talk at eResearch conference because it's a pretty similar Connect's version of that. Um, so the Nectar program, Inchris program was started in 2010. The Nectar Research Cloud came out of that, started in 2011 and, and went into production in 2012. In 2016, the National Research Infrastructure Roadmap called for a merger of the Nectar and an RDS program. So that happened in 2018 with the formation of the Australian Research Data Commons or ARDC, oops, sorry. Um, so, hang on a minute. Oh, sorry, I think the slide's gone ahead without me. Anyway, so it's been quite successful. We've got quite a lot of usage for the uh, research cloud. We've got over 1,700 active projects last year, uh, 8,000 virtual machines, 4,000 total projects since the start of the cloud, uh, hosts many services, supports many of the Inchris capabilities and other platforms and so on. Um, we had almost 3,000 active users, i.e. users who run a virtual machine last year from almost all universities in Australia. Uh, we're supporting uh, over 300 ARC and NH and MRC grants and a few hundred other research grants. All 22 field of research closed, so it's a very broad uh, use, user base and almost all four digit uh, FOR codes. So the new stuff. Um, so the strategy for ARDC has been initially will be uh, refreshing the clouds are investing four and a half million dollars to refresh the Nectar Research Cloud, uh, which is the first new capital investment that we funded for quite some time. And our node partners are providing at least matching co-investment to operate that infrastructure. And we'll be providing another uh, $3 million a year for the next three years to for new infrastructure and services. So we wanna expand the capacity of the cloud, uh, particularly with a focus on supporting ARDC priorities projects, including the platforms projects. Uh, a new round of platforms projects has just been announced today, if you wanna look at those. Um, and also uh, prioritize support on sort of innovative, sort of leading edge infrastructure, like things like GPUs or very large memory servers are quite expensive things. So where are we? Um, we are in the process of doing a refresh of the research cloud now. Uh, the Uni Melbourne uh, refresh is finished. Uh, the TPAC new infrastructure will be available next month, Monash after that, and Intersect and QCIF have been delayed a bit uh, to May. All of this has been delayed a bit due to COVID, as you might imagine. We were hoping to have all this up and running by now, but there's been a, a, a little bit of delay to that. Uh, the NCI node will also be decommissioned at the end of the year. They're going to be focusing on their own, uh, their own cloud infrastructure. So we'll have a significant amount of capacity. This, uh, the capacity listed there, the new capacity is solely to support the sort of nationally prioritized project allocations. There will also obviously be the nodes themselves are investing in infrastructure to support their locally prioritized projects. Um, so as well as that refresh of existing infrastructure, we're also putting in $2 million this year of new infrastructure to support the uh, platforms projects primarily is the focus there. So we've gathered requirements of those projects. Much of the infrastructure will be supporting the sort of leading edge, um, you know, expensive equipment, GPUs, large memory servers and so on. Um, plus some additional just sort of standard uh, capacity to, uh, to make sure those platforms have the capacity that they need. Um, we're aiming to have that uh, deployed before June of next year. 
and as I said, we have additional uh, investment for, for the next couple of years after that for, for more um, capacity, uh, infrastructure and, and services. Other things we'll be looking to do. So we've got a new um, skills specialist uh, role for position starting in January next year. We'll be looking to improve the tutorials and our training and, and uh, online uh, information and running um, webinars and things like that in future. This user forum we're aiming to continue and to have other sort of more regular meetings where, you, where the technical people using the cloud can talk to the ARDC core services staff and node staff. Um, this year, this um, financial year, I should say, we're, we're looking to deploy some new services, a virtual desktop infrastructure, uh, Jupyter Hub, so we can run Jupyter Notebooks as a service, uh, project to look at integration with commercial cloud, and then so some general improvements of dashboard uh, and Murano App Store and so on. Uh, one important thing, though, again, which we always do, is try to incorporate new functionality that's coming along from OpenStack projects. So things at the moment we're looking at are things like preemptible or spot instances, uh, reservations for virtual machines, um, new support that's coming along for accelerators like GPUs and how those are managed in the cloud. Um, so that's all happening uh, over the next um, few weeks, oh, sorry, the next few months uh, for, for this financial year. And I think that's about it for me. So I will stop sharing my screen and I'll take any questions that people might have about any of that. Thanks, Paul. Um, and people can either um, unmute themselves and ask a question or put it in the chat. And I forgot to say that obviously we can collect questions as we go in the chat and we'll handle them at the end as well. If there are any quick questions for Paul, we can do them now. Otherwise, if you think of one, as I said, put it in the chat, and that, and uh, and we'll do it a bit later. And there may be some that arise during the during the uh, the breakouts, Paul. So thank you for that. Um, if we could, uh, what we'll now do is if I'll ask Avi and and James to to talk to us. Avi is the technical um, the technical lead and the solutions architect for the Echo Commons platform, and James works with him uh, as a web designer for the Echo Co Commons platforms both at, uh, at Griffith University. Um, so I'll hand over to you guys, thank you. All right, thanks, Riz. Um, so hi, everybody. My name is Arvi, and as Riz said, I'm the tech lead on the EcoCommerce platform. And with me today to present uh, a little bit about how we use uh, Nectar is James Lee, which is a, a web developer and designer with the EcoCommerce platform as well. Um, so today we're going to go through two main parts. One is we're going to go through how we're currently using Nectar with BCCVL, which is the current service that we are now responsible for that's already running on Nectar services. And then we're going to go through how we're setting up uh, our structure or infrastructure on Nectar for the new EcoCommons platform, which we uh, are in development of at the moment. All right. Thanks, Avi. Um, so just an introduction to BCCBL, um, if you're not aware of what it was, uh, what it is. Um, it's the Biodiversity and Climate Change Virtual Laboratory. Um, and the goal of that is really to enable researchers to investigate, explore, and accelerate biodiversity and climate change research. And it does this by providing a single online environment for accessing and visualizing climate and environmental data sets and to run biodiversity and climate change modeling on um, behalf of users without users having to actually write any code at all. Um, so all they have to do is just point, click, fill in a few uh, information um, into the form and off it goes. Um, and BCCVL has been happily operating on Nectar since 2014. There we go. Um, so the key parts of BCCVL are the application itself, uh, its workers and the data that we have to uh, handle and capture. So for the application, that's the website itself. Um, and also we have a data visualization service. So things like a map server, which renders all the um, gra geographical data that we have. Uh, for workers, uh, they're responsible for running the modeling experiments and they tend to have a fairly high CPU and memory requirements. Um, and they also do spend quite a fair bit of time um, on various different models, sometimes from 
minutes, hours to days. And for data, uh, we accept both user uploaded data and data that we import from third party services like our partners at ALA. And also the modeling outputs that get generated from uh, the experiments. So how Nectar meets the needs of BCCVL? Uh, currently we use three major parts of Nectar. So we've got the virtual machines, uh, data volumes, and the object store. So for our virtual machines, they uh, currently have uh, our application running inside of them, and also uh, a number of them, which are the individual workers. Um, and all of them, or most of them are RAM optimized instances because we do have, again, those high uh, RAM uh, requirements. And at the moment they're working pretty well. Uh, we've recently actually migrated them from NCI as explained before where NCI is shutting down to uh, Tasmania with their TPAC node. Uh, for our volumes, uh, we store application data and also uh, serve scratch base to each worker, which is roughly about 100 gigabytes at the moment per worker. And that is responsible for just to temporarily hold data when the models are executed. And finally, for all of our data that we do actually store long term, uh, that's stored in the object store. And so that's things like the data sets and the modeling outputs from the experiments. And at the moment, we're holding over three terabytes of data uh, on behalf of users and uh, the data sets that we are responsible for. So all of that supports 6,000 users or more than 6,000 users from all over the world and uh, over 110,000 experiments since 2014. So we think that Nectar has been able to support BCCVL um, quite well over the last six years. And now I hand over uh, to Ave, who will describe more about how uh, BCCVL is evolving into the new project called EcoCommons. Perfect, thanks, James. Um, so as James just mentioned, we are, are currently uh, moving BCCVL, well, we just moved BCCVL from the NCI node into onto the TPAC node. So as a necessity since the NCI node was shutting down. Uh, but uh, in the process, we, you know, we got the chance to actually do some improvements to the overall structure of the stack while containerizing all elements of the stack. So everything on BCC AVL now is running uh, through Docker containers. Um, and in a little bit more uh, manageable format uh, before we actually move the, the features into EcoCommons. So James, if you want to go to the next slide. So what we are developing with EcoCommons is what we want to be is a portal of choice to analyze and model ecological and environmental problems uh, for researchers. So we want to take all the things that have been working with BCCVL and in addition, EcoCloud, and we want to bring that functionality in a more generic format inside one platform so that we can have uh, more ability for reuse and interoperation uh, to other services and other platforms and also the chance to actually expand to different research domains such as like BCCVL you know has been focused on the climate change sector um, we you know there is similar modeling needs uh, the, the need to, to run experiments in a similar way for other research domains like agriculture, biosecurity, which is, um, you know, part of the new platforms funding round that's just got accepted as well. So this is really exciting to see how we can integrate uh, with all these new research domains using all the good parts and uh, what has been working for BCCVL so far. Did you go to the next slide, James? Um, you, you could think of like the role of how the EcoCommons platform would be. Um, if you see on the left hand side, you have model development and testing. Currently we have uh, EcoCloud, which is also running on Nectar and has been running for about three years probably now on Nectar, uh, running on Kubernetes uh, inside Nectar. Uh, and that allows researchers to go in and have a pre-set pre up um, environment 
to use uh, a command line interface to, to set up and start running their model and experiment and, and fine tune models before actually running it uh, on proper data. And it gives them access to actually run this on a cloud, uh, cloud infrastructure instead of having to run it on their own computers. So um, we have that on the left where people can actually explore the data and then that can be then evolved into more trusted models and data platforms such as the BCCVL where you can have a virtual laboratory for a specific research domain um, where you can have all these models that are uh, kind of agreed on for this domain and available uh, with access to data sets and data sources that might otherwise be really difficult to, to, to get to. Um, and that can be used by this whole, uh, the research community uh, and that research domain to, to develop uh, a very easy interface for uh, research to do their modeling. And the, the final step on this, uh, on this pipeline, as you can see, is decision support. So uh, what we want to take um, uh, the EcoCommons platform and what PCCVL has done for research, it would take it to the next level and actually offer a platform where a uh, government agency or people with that's doing uh, policy and decision making, having uh, designated portals for doing decision support. So the CSDM, which is the um, uh, collaborative uh, species distribution modeling portal, uh, is a collaboration with different government uh, departments going in and being able to, we, we developed this as a proof of, proof of concept. Uh, so these uh, users from this agency can go in and share uh, potentially sensitive data with each other and run experiments and share the results with each other. So this allows having the ability to build portals like this on top of the infrastructure we're building allows uh, for better collaboration between, at the moment, you you could, for example, have different government agency or, you know, say biosecurity uh, researchers or decision makers in uh, South Australia might use a different model to determine things to those in Queensland, uh, just because there is not enough tools for collaboration with this. Uh, when you have a portal uh, that you can deploy on a national level and deploy individual individual models that are trusted and can be reused, you can then ensure the consistency of modeling the same kind of um, the same kind of um, experiments and for example species distribution model or risk mapping or things like that they can model in a similar way and you can have that consistency between even between the different states and the different uh, decision makers the different government groups and you can make a better overall kind of decision-making process by having a similar data and using a platform that's secure, that can securely uh, have host sensitive data, run models on that and share the results within uh, a, a selected user group. So we're trying to take EcoCloud BCCVL, take it into a new platform that's gonna be more generic, but allow us to reuse the, a lot of the underlying functionality. Uh, of those systems, but then increasing the user base of this. So if we go to the next slide, um, we will be using very much similar to what James um, uh, mentioned before for BCCVL. So we'll be using virtual machines and that's gonna be for the application nodes and the job workers that's gonna do some of the processing. And we also, on the allocation at the moment, we have the RAM optimized instances because a lot of the experiments uh, do tend to uh, require a lot of memory. So this is, you know, some experiments might use even higher memory needs than what we can get from a normal virtual machine flavor. So I'll touch base, uh, I'll touch on that a little bit later when I go through some of the different parts of the platform. In addition to, to the virtual machines, we use volumes and same as from BCCVL, we'll store application data and also use it for scratch base for the worker machine. So we can have the, sometimes they have generate a large amount of data while they're actually processing the experiment. So we need that extra space. The object store is used for modeling outputs, it's used for data sets and also for user data. Um, 
the functionality from EcoCloud. Each user uh, has their own user account and they will have an allocation there. At the moment on EcoCloud, it's uh, 10 gigabytes. So we will, when the user spins up a new server, um, we will sync their, their folder uh, from the object store into a volume that's mounted into the machine and they will be able to access the files they have there. The new thing uh, with EcoCommons is that we're using Kubernetes uh, to uh, orchestrate all our containers. So all our uh, services are containerized and deployed onto Kubernetes clusters that we are currently using Nexter's Magnum service, uh, which I assume Jake is gonna be talking about a little bit later in the tech talk. Uh, so that allows us to dynamically actually create new clusters and we can run uh, separate clusters within our allocation and easily deploy our services to this um, to the different Kubernetes clusters. The next slide. So as I mentioned, Kubernetes clusters to run the services. Um, we use GitLab for all our code repositories. Um, also, we're using GitLab CI, which are, is our continuous integration pipeline where we run through code testing and uh, security testing, you know, building the, the container images. I will touch more into that uh, in the following slide. And we use also, at the moment, we're using GitLab's container registries to push our images into. Um, for our deployment of our services, we're currently using Flux CD. Um, Flux is uh, something called a GitOps operator. So to try to explain it easily, um, we install Flux in each of the clusters and Flux then syncs back automatically to a repository that we have with all, where we have all the configuration files for the services that we want um, to deploy for a cluster. So we, in the repository, we could, for example, then have a, a dev, a test, and production folder. And the configuration files for each of the services would lie underneath each of those folders. And uh, when Flux, if Flux then detects a change, it will automatically uh, deploy the changed um, changed uh, image if it's set up for it. So that means that we can, for example, for dev and test, we can set it up to automatically pull the latest image, deploy it, uh, and we'll have that ready. And in production, we can have a more controlled environment where we say only deploy these specific versions of the services so that we have uh, a full control of what actually goes in into to the various clusters. All our services are now containerized. Uh, our own services are containerized using Docker. Um, we're currently using Next.js and React to build our front-end uh, application or application services. Um, while the majority, at least, of the API services will be built with Python and Django uh, for the back end, um, there might be this is what we just started the development now, and this is what we're looking at. Those things might change. We might have to adopt additional technologies as needs arise, but that is like a brief overview of the technologies that we're using at the moment. If we go to the next slide, I have a fairly high level overview of the architecture, just to explain some of the core uh, things that we're running in each cluster. Uh, so as you see, the, the top kind of dotted square is a Kubernetes cluster. Think of it as we will have three of those for dev, test, and prod. Uh, so you have some core services that you need to have the cluster running, like things like certificate managers and monitoring services, and then some core platform services like um, a search index, a queue, uh, a web client to browse different services. But then we have the four boxes there in the middle row. Um, that's basically the, the four main parts of functionality of the platform. So we have the analysis playground. And this is what currently is EcoCloud that will be renamed into this part. This is where users can actually think of it as, a, um, as Paul mentioned previously, uh, Nectar is looking to expand into getting like a Jupyter Notebook service. Uh, so this is our version of this where the user can actually log in and they get their own Jupyter Notebook, their own service up and running. Um, then we have the function toolbox and this is where we are gonna take all, 
from BCCVL, for example, with taking all the different models that people can run with exporting into, into individual functions. And that means that people can then pick and choose which functions they want to use with their data. Uh, and it also means that we can then amass a library or a function catalog of all these functions where the platform can be used in a much more generic way than just for one uh, domain of research. The data explorer is where uh, users can explore the data of the, system, the the data sets that are available. So we have we're going to have data sets that are a curated set where we uh, pull in the data and generate additional metadata, and people can actually run through and see visualizations on the data. We're going to pull in additional data sets through. Uh, third party connections like the knowledge network or other um, external API connections so that users can then get the, the ability to discover additional data sets that could be relevant for their research um, very easily and then having um, information around how they can use or quickly use the data to how to download the, the data and how to use this when they're going to run in their experiments. We also have one box, the red dot there of user uploaded data. So part of the e-commerce platform will be to develop a component around uh, sensitive data haven. Uh, so this is where users can actually upload some part of their own data and that can be managed separately. Like you, they can select the, the privacy and the licensing settings on those uh, on that data and it can either be completely private, they can choose who they want to share it with, or they can make it as market as public. Um, then we have the result manager. This is where we can uh, allow users to look at the results from their existing experiments or their existing jobs, and then add on layers on top of it with, the, from, uh, with ex additional data sets to, for example, you have run a species distribution model, and then you would, would like to add on additional layers like some infrastructure or uh, planning, uh, some planning data sets so you can see potentially the, the effects of that on, uh, on top of that, and then generate additional results on top of your experiment. So part of the, the whole result and sharing the allowing users to share the how they got this result will be really important so that the users will be able to share okay i use this data set these are the parameters and this is the result it created so then people could then come in and reuse that recipe basically and they could tweak parameters change the data source or do other changes and rerun it and get uh you know continue on the work from the previous researcher. Uh, so that can be uh, a really great feature for, for people to actually get that continuous flow in the research and uh, improve upon uh, the, the different models and the different works being done by different uh, users. On the bottom uh, of this uh, diagram, we have the job manager. So this is actually where the we do the function execution or the uh, the compute. So currently we have separated that out from the standard platform cluster. And this is uh, purely for scalability so that we can, what we want to do is we want to add the ability to add multiple additional clusters where these jobs can be run. So that could be run, for example, on a cluster of virtual machines, whether it's on Nectar, whether it will be somewhere else, potentially uh, if we would be able to use allocation on HPC clusters. Um, that this part hasn't been completely uh, figured out how we go with, especially with HPC, but since we have separated out, um, we are at least have the ability to scale the platform's ability to uh, run heavy processing projects or experiments without actually stopping the whole platform for the users. Uh, we're taking kind of the, the responsibility away from the application platform. This way we can ensure that the platform itself is always uh, responsive uh, 
and quick to use and also doesn't take up too much resources in itself. It's more the, the heavy part will be done by the computation. If you go to the next slide, um, a little bit about our how we're working our development pipeline. So we start from the left. We have, uh, of course, the, everything starts with version control. So that's the code. Uh, we have a developer and he uh, then he or she commits some code. It goes into back into the code repository. And then we have GitLab CI, our continuous integration, who runs uh, a range of jobs onto this uh, code. So he does things like static analysis, security tests, units and functional tests. And if this fails, it go back to the developer uh, and they can try again until they get a pass. Uh, once it builds successfully all test passing, we push our con we build and push a container image into container registry. And as I mentioned before, with Flux, how we deploy things, you see we have three clusters, dev, staging, and production. We have a Flux controller in each of them. So they will periodically check every five minutes, they go and check in the version control. Are there any changes we need to do? If there are any changes, it uh, goes up to the container registry and deploys those changes automatically. So that's how we can then automate uh, as much as possible of this whole development or uh, con using continuous integration and continuous deployment on Nectar. And, and so far uh, we've been using uh, Nectar's Magnum service and um, so far it's looking good. It looks like everything's working. There are of course always things that are a little bit trickier to do in OpenStack as opposed to um, if you have on public cloud. But you know, the I have to say the the Nectar tech support team has been really responsive and me helping us with uh, all the queries we had around getting things to work. So we're really appreciative of uh, of the support we're getting, and we look forward to using Nectar uh, for um, for eco comments in in the years to to come now. All Thank right. you. Thanks, Irving. We're running a little bit over time. So unless someone's got a really burning question for Arvid, can I suggest we put it in the chat and we come back to it? Thank you to you and to James for your talk. Um, and in the interest of time, I think we'll just press press straight on. Sorry to do that to everybody, um, but we will have a bit of time a bit later to catch up. Um, Luca, could I ask uh, you to tell us about your application of the uh, of Nectar? Cool. Uh... Yeah, as I mentioned before, I have a problem with sharing my screen on iPad. So, so Jake is going someone... to Jake yeah, is going to provide you. that support. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry to press on Ave and and James. That's no way a reflection of the quality of your presentation. But we'll just keep moving and come back to the questions. Thanks, Luca. Okay, so without further ado, so I will bring you through a journey of how we have used uh, Nectar throughout the years. Uh, a different, a different uh, sophistication level, levels of sophistication. Uh, okay, so this will be a tile of uh, evolution. Oops, I, I don't. Yeah, thanks. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> You're a bit too well, eager, mate. First time. <laughs> you want? <laughs> you want going back to the previous slide? Okay. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, leave it there. Thanks. So, um, so we started with manual provisioning of VMs, and then we ended up with Kubernetes clusters over pff, the last nine years or so. So, and uh, in keeping with the evolutionary theme of this um, this presentation, uh, here are the different steps of the evolution of whales from um, terrestrial mammals that. Um, um, lived in swamps to the ocean going creatures that we all know and love. Do you mind going to the next one? Thanks. So, a few words about myself. Uh, I've got 40 years of experience of the development, mainly in geospatial. I've been contributing for the last 20 years or so to different open source projects. I've brought some modules in GeoTools, GeoServer, stuff like that. So, travel the world work in a few places as you may see. And eight years ago, I was stranded on Australian shores, um, working at the Melbourne Research Group of the um, 
School of Engineering and holding the position of uh, data architect at the Orin project, uh, which is what I mainly do. So next slide, please. So a few words, the Australian Urban Information Network is, uh, is a project which was established in 2011 and has a mission to provide urban researchers for to, with data and analytical tools. So we've got our main product is the portal. Um, and from the comfort of your web browser, you can go there, shop for data from heterogeneous data sources, ABS, LandGate, there are a bunch. And then you pick up your data and then you analyze those data with the um, analytical tools that we provide, store your results, you can map them, chart them, stuff like that. So we've been in operations for about nine years. We've got 200 users daily, uh, but that clearly changes you know, from day to day, depending on the um, ebb and flow of acad the academic year. We peak this year to 6,000 users uh, in one day, but usually we've got way less than that. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so we started eight years ago by deploying single VMs uh, for very specific tasks and, and using the dashboard, the, the Nectar dashboard. We didn't use Docker containers at the time. Uh, we didn't cluster the DBMSs. It was very, very, very simple, uh, very, very simple times. Now, since Nectar at the time was somewhat unreliable, we provision our own, we had our own hardware co-hosted in the same uh, data centers of, um, of uh, Nectar. And we use VMware as virtualization software. So we still, we use VMs, uh, but our own kits, our own, uh, not, not a cloud yet, but kind of a private cloud. Next slide, please. Okay, then about seven years ago, something like that, uh, we started working with Docker containers again, Everything was done manually using the dashboard and we deployed um, Docker containers manually. Next. Um, we delved into um, an ad hoc client, um, internally developed client um, that used the OpenStack and um, um, Docker APIs to automate this, this process. In hindsight, that was a, a bit of a, of, a, of a dead end uh, technologically, uh, but it did what it was supposed to do. I deployed quite a few applications with it, but other tools were maturing in the in the meantime, and so using um, having an internally de de developed client didn't really make more much sense after um, the initial the, the few years. So next, please. So we moved to Docker Swarm, of this, not, not the, the main or portal, but some activities were uh, and still run on Docker Swarms like our uh, API. So you can have access to or in uh, data sets using an API as well. And that uh, ran and still runs on, uh, on Docker Swarm. And uh, so the provisioning was done with hit templates, so no longer a manual process, and uh, deployment of um, uh, applications on uh, Docker Swarm was done using compose files and a mix of shell scripts. And clearly the, the internally developed client was discontinued. Please next. So then one year ago, along came Magnum. So, uh, some of the provisioning was done with them uh, into place, but some of it using Magnum. Uh, set up a Kubernetes with shell script and uh, YAML file as usual. So we started experimenting with uh, databases, uh, cluster databases on Kubernetes, um, with enterprise message buses, that sort of um, middleware stuff. Um, again, we had a there were initial problems. Well, Kubernetes is not uh, exactly easy, and uh, Magnum, Magnum has improved over the last year, but initially was not 
completely um, reliable, let's put it this way. So next, please. Now, present, what we are doing at, uh, at present with Kubernetes, we uh, um, have deployed uh, streaming platforms such as Kafka, functions as a service uh, environments so using Knative, uh, notebooks as a service with Jupyter Hub. This is still prototypical stuff. So we are experimenting with it, developing prototypes is not yet available to the, to the average uh, or end user. Microservices as well with K, with Camel K, which is the Kubernetes port of um, of Camel Apache Camel, um, and not me personally, but some of my user, so, so some of our colleagues are experimenting with Terraform as well, especially for our continuous integration, continuous deployment uh, pipeline. So next, please. Okay, given all this technology. What we what do we do with it? Um, so the next story release will be totally on Nectar. So we moved away from uh, from VMware, which was a bit long in the tooth. Uh, the the, the kit the kit was old. Um, as I mentioned, our own CI CD pipeline is on Kubernetes as well. We collect vehicular traffic. This is a relatively um, new project, and uh, so to the tune of six gigabytes of, um, of data a day. So basically there are uh, 8 million different readings of vehicular traffic sensors stored every day. Another thing that we do, we collect social media posts from uh, Instagram and then Twitter, and possibly we will expand that in the near future. We collect data from heterogeneous data sources or in that. So we are, we are in the process of um, uh, rolling out in, 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 in a, a prototype um, that will use um, Jupyter Hub as a Jupyter Notebooks and um, a, a microservices and Kubernetes and Knative, a function as a service, sorry for all the acronym soup, uh, based uh, service for um, collecting um, collected data in the portal, the are portal. So please next. So let me say that Nectar has some great advantages as you have inferred by now, we have been one of the first users of, of Nectar. Uh, I personally started using in 2012 when I came to, to Melbourne. So, and it has some great advantages, okay? So it is free. Well, let's not discount uh, the, the, um, the, the, the freedom of experimentation that comes with it. I don't need to justify everything that I do to a manager. Um, it would, would be the case in, uh, for a, <clears throat> with a commercial cloud. It has great people behind it. I mean, uh, the, when I open a ticket, it is usually solved quickly, and my tickets tend to be relatively complicated, non-trivial. So usually they go straight to the uh, third layer tier of technical support. But again, I can see that people are really trying hard to help me, and uh, I'm very grateful of that. And Nectar has grown more robust over a year. Uh, as I mentioned, in two, when we started using it, 2011, 2012, uh, even the basic um, services like compute and storage were somehow not a, a, a bit flimsy. Um, and that those services have improved quite a lot over the years. And that and this is to um, uh, to test some of it. Uh, but next slide. We are still not quite there. Other than being oversubscribed, which is, I think, the tragedy of the commons, so cannot really be helped. With. Um, sometimes resources are tight. Uh, we had crisis on the floating IP addresses or large VMs. You know, every now and then there is a there is a problem with provisioning resources. 
there are there were software upgrades that lasted hours. Sometimes the network grade uh, what it was a year ago that lasted one or two days. OpenStack is not truly reliable. My experience with Magnum has been mixed. Again, has improved, uh, but still, uh, we still face um, issues with stack volumes or um, with Octavia, with the Octavia load balancers and so on. So it's not completely reliable, okay? So we have to, to think a bit about um, uh, putting things in production. And there is also the, the issue of sensitive data. So which might be solved with volume encryption. This we had a problem because we uh, were given um, um, sensitive uh, data from the Australian Business Register. And those data came with a, a strict um, terms of use. And so we, we had to, to take uh, to say to to have strict control of, of those data in, uh, to be to be compliant with this, this terms of use, and uh, so we have not really found a solution for it. Maybe volume encryption will do, and uh, there may be other data sets that are sensitive. In not sensitive in the sense that they, those are high value data that uh, data custodians could give us to us only under uh, strict, really strict terms of use. Um, and that's about it, I guess. Questions, last, next slide. Thanks, Luca. We've got time for one or two very quick questions. Otherwise I could go on the chat. Thank you. Not at this stage. All right, thank Hi, you. actually, I'll just have a quick question if Come I can. On. Yes, of yeah. course. Hi, um, Luca, thanks for that. Um, and thanks for saying what works and what doesn't work. Um, I suppose as well, what's interesting for me is that um, Nectar kind of balances between supporting research projects for a period of time and balances these longer term platforms, um, as we've heard mentioned from um, Echo Commons, BCCDL, and obviously now ORN as well. So what do you think would assist in us um, supporting those longer term platforms going forward? Um, look, uh, the, what I like to, what we like to most is the reliability in terms of, um, uh, well, okay, understand that it is not, it has to do with OpenStack, okay, more than Nectar itself. But this is what we, we, we really like because we were a long running process a project and we will run for, for a few years more. So reliability of the platform is really uh, paramount for us. And clearly resources as well in terms of um, planning the availability of resources. So be okay. sure that the resources will stay with us uh, for, for say, for a few years at least, so without change. Uh, I mean, I'm referring to the split, to the MRC Nectar split, which yeah. caused us uh, quite a bit of pain, still causing us pain. I understand mm -hmm. this, I don't know if it is, it's probably beyond your control, so I'm not, uh, but still. So I'm here for to make the world a better place. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's Thank good, you. it's good to have that feedback. Thank you, Luca. And actually that sort of leads us on to to this next session quite well, Carmel and and, uh, and Luca, because we're just going to go into breakout rooms now. And that's exactly the kind of honest conversation that we like to have with you guys is, you know, what is working, but what isn't working? And what do you think you're going to need it going into the future? So I'll put you into breakout rooms in a second, uh, randomly assigned. We've got um, Andy, Sam, Kieran and Steve from the Nectar Cloud uh, support guys to facilitate those rooms and they'll take you through that. Well, I think in the interest of time, what we might do guys is about 20 minutes um, and come back just a little bit early, um, but you'll get, a, you'll get a five minute notification. So I will do that now. I'll see you back shortly. So you'll see a message saying that you, you've been asked to go to a room.
Have I got some people here who haven't gone to rooms yet? Uh... So Glenn, did you join the meeting late? Oh no. Oh yes, okay. Yeah, I did. There you go. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I think everyone's now assigned. Hopefully that'll work. Brendan, are you there? 